so uh, so the purpose was to show that uh, how can we be uh, how does probability enter a picture in proving a mathematical theorem which has nothing to do with probability theory and uh, it's not somebody says it can be done but indeed uh, this shows that uh, uh, by the way weierstrass proved his original thing was 1888 and the next thing was uh, the, the bernstein's uh, 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 article which i shared that was 1912 and this was before kolmogorov's thing which brought probability theory back to mathematics okay. he created a mathematical framework where probability theory became acceptable not immediately but eventually but bernstein doing this is before uh uh kolmogorov's framework and uh soon after kolmogorov then erdos uh, came in and he started using it in the way that i already explained so even in applying it for what can be called a pure mathematical result it can be used and of course it has can be and has been in, in use for various other things as well over period of time okay all right so now uh, till now we have only talked about what is a uh what are the probability of events and what is a random variable now uh, rarely is a case when we are only interested in one random variable at a time typically you have more than one and uh, so now two random variables are said to be independent if uh, p capital x x equal to alpha and y equal to gamma is product of x equal to alpha and y equal to gamma so in other words uh this is a technical condition uh so you can say on r2 a measure is a product measure if measure of a rectangle is equal to product of this side and that side right it is something like that mathematically and uh in applications what it means that is if you have created so we can read it as, as follows if you believe and you have constructed a good model for x you you have constructed a good model for y and you believe that the two have nothing to do with each other what happens in x has no role in what happens in y so you take two dice being tossed or two coins being tossed and assume that there is no magnetism which one is implying the other and so on and so forth no such games okay you pick one coin from one friend another friend gives another coin you take the two together and you are tossing it and you if you know or if you think that you can success correctly model uh, what happens with probability of x and what happens with probability of y then and you believe that they are independent happening of one has no role in the happening on the other then the left hand side gives you a good model for uh, a probability space on which both x and y are defined as functions and now you have assigned probabilities to individual outcomes there and if they are independent if this holds then one can verify that uh, for all functions f and g from omega to r plus expected value of product of fx and gy becomes product of expectation of fx and expectation of gy this is a trivial uh, computation for uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, uh, from the where what we are dealing with namely countable uh, uh, space omega and in general as you could see that you have uh, measure on x and x is it measure on y axis you can take the product measure and on product measure this one will work now let's come to this interesting part if x and y are independent random variables suppose both expectation squares are finite expectation x is mu and expectation y is gamma then we compute what is variance of x plus y and uh so using linearity and various other such things so this is expectation x plus y minus mu minus mu so expectation of x y x plus y is mu plus mu so using that we will get uh this Uh, now we can 
x and mu we take together, y and mu we take together, and sum of squares we expand. x square, square, and product term. Now, these two as it is. Here, independence will tell us that this product expectation of the product is product of the expectation. And mu is the expected x minus x is zero, so expected of x minus mu will be zero. This will be zero. So therefore, this term is zero, and we just get the sum of these two, which is variance of the sum is variance of x plus y. Trivial calculation. Now, uh, from two, we can straight away move to n-dimensional objects. So you have random variables x1, x2, xn. They are independent if for all aj, uh, probability that xj equal to aj 1 less than equal to j less than equal to n is simply the product. So, two-dimensional product to n-dimensional product. Okay? And this part that we did here, variance of the sum is equal to sum of the variances, same calculation will come and you will get uh, that variance of the sum is sum of the variances. The simplest example to do will be you take omegas to be finite sets. Omega 1, omega 2, omega 5 to be 5 finite sets. Each one, you can, the probabilities could be equally likely. So each of them will be 1 over the total number of things. Now you take any function on each of them, take their sum and now try to compute what is being called as variance, you will see this factor. Okay. And next, we come to a theme which is uh, common in statistics courses primarily. x1, x2, xn are said to be independent, identically distributed random variables. And it is abbreviated as IID. First I is independent, second I is identical, and third, D, third one is D, so distributed, IID. So, statistics courses, uh, you just say, hey, oh, let x be IID. That's it. So, uh, this is uh, for all uh, A1, A2, AN. So, the first time is saying identically distributed. Namely, uh, the association of probabilities for each of them. So, here is xj and here is x1. You could have said xj equal to xk for any j and k, but we just to be precise, we say it is exactly equal to the first one. Okay. So the first term is saying it is identically distributed, and second was saying that that is independent. And then the computations we did earlier will tell us that if the mean of everything will be the same as mean of first, which will be mu, let's say, and variance of everything will be the same as variance of the first one, which we say put it as sigma square. And we will get that the variance of the n-fold sum is the sum of the n-fold variances, which will give you n sigma square. Okay. So one may wonder, what is the big deal about this? Well, now comes the crux. So if x1, x2, xn are iid, they say they have common mean mu, variance, common variance is sigma square. Now, Let's try to compute this object. What this is x1 plus x2 plus xn by n. Okay. So this is this will be like if, if you assume that you are repeating some experiment, x1 is the first outcome, x2 is the second outcome. It could be tossing a coin, it could be tossing a dice, it could be some more complicated experiment. So successive experiments are independent. What happened first time has nothing to do with what happened second time. Okay. So then, and then you are looking at their average, observed average. So x1 plus x2 plus xn by n is the observed average. Okay. So observed average minus the population mean. Mu can be thought of as the distributional mean or whatever population mean. So observed average minus mu square, we take the variance and that this calculation which we did trivially earlier reduced to 1 by n sigma square. And then use Chebyshev's inequality, 
you will get that probability that x1 plus x2 plus xn by n minus mu bigger than equal to epsilon less than equal to 1 by epsilon square 1 by n epsilon sigma epsilon square. And now you you have mu and sigma are anyway fixed. Let's fix epsilon and let n go to uh, uh, <clears throat> let epsilon be fixed, uh, mu sigma are fixed and let n go to infinity. What happens? This will go to zero. So, left hand side also goes to zero. That is probability that x1 plus x2 plus xn by n minus mu bigger than equal to epsilon goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Observed average is the ensemble average or population average depending on the physics terminology or distributional mean probability terminology. Observed average converges to the true mean. This is what is called law of large numbers and goes back nearly 500 years ago, earlier, starting with loose statement by Carrano, Jacob Bernoulli and whole lot of names associated. Uh, this leads to in uh, physics and some appli physical applications and also in math, the ergodic theorem. All that is related to origins are, could be this. Okay that observed average converges to the population average if you are observing this independently. Uh, <clears throat> and for, of course, we are doing a very special case. We are doing a case where our random variables are taking only countable mini values. In fact, our omega itself is a countable object. And therefore, all these calculations and proofs and so on statements are simply statements about uh, sequences and series of uh, real, random, real uh, numbers. Interpretation is different. So this one by itself is something uh, you, you can forget this random variables and you can write down this as an expression involving uh, uh, just the sequences. Okay. And, uh, uh, but that by itself may not be who will care about even if you write down such a statement. But when you write it in this form, because it is applicable in large number of contexts, it becomes important. This also, or law of large numbers of this statement is also kind of why does one believe that if you think that some event is uncertain, why do we think that mathematical theory can give, mathematical frameworks and theory can give you any insight into it? And that whole thing starts by, this, ob this thing had been observed ages ago, namely events which appear to be uncertain at micro level, namely individual level, when take even at a macroscopic level, when you combine them together, you see patterns. And that is law of large numbers. Each x is random variable. When we are taking together and taking average, it is coming closer and closer to a fixed number mu. So, uh, uncertainty at microscopic level, but leading to macroscopic uh, patterns. And this has been observed in uh, domains where people have kept data for for uh, centuries. Things related to uh, uh, weather and births in towns, male child versus female child, uh, what proportion or how many, etc. Data has been kept in many countries, many cities, uh, and uh, centuries, and. Weather amounts to taking, uh, taking data on temperature, max temperature, mean temperature, or in a, um, um, uh, at a beach uh, or a, 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 a location where there is a, a seashore, uh, the uh, height of the uh, high tide and low tide heights. Now, Bombay, for example, High tide, low tide data is there, but does anybody care? 
unless you want to go to beach and swim or do something very special activity, you will try to find out when is the high tide, when is the low tide. Or if you want to take our small kids there for some fun, we can think about it. But otherwise, who cares when is the high tide, when is the low tide? But go to, let's say, Netherlands. By the way, the Netherlands amounts to saying the law, uh, 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 lower lands. But literally, if one takes the average height from mean sea level across Netherlands, it is less than zero. Less than. So, the, as a whole, uh, di several districts of uh, Holland, uh, their average height or level from mean sea level is negative. That means if somehow water one centers, it is not going to go. So, it was important for them to do, uh, to track how high the sea tide may go and therefore create a dam which is that high and dam in, they use dike. That is the origin of the word dike, which is also a surname in Holland. Dick Van Dyke is a surname of a family name. So, this has been an important problem in Holland for generations, for decades and they have data I am told that for 500 years or more, they have data on uh, high tide levels at several locations on the coast of Holland. And uh, they want to use that to decide how high should the... Is it growing up? If it is growing up, we have to raise all the dikes, their heights, and so on and so forth. So, the fact that microscopic uncertainty in a certain cases leads to macroscopic patterns uh, made it possible that if you can de develop a pack, develop a uh, model which will explain this feature then that is a beginning of probability theory or that can be that, that can be thought of as importance of probability theory okay but of course this one is leading only to iid then there are you don't need of course, mathematically, everybody wants to do generalizations, right? So, we all have read it sometime or the other. Okay, it is true for IID. Can we say, can we take out the first I? Can we take out the second ID? Second ID is easier to take out. You can put some conditions on their distributions. They may not be same, but if they don't divert too much, oh, oh this thing works. Okay. I'm not going to state those, but And this is, I didn't want to keep on going on on this theme, but this is just the beginning. Then there is law of large numbers. This is law of large numbers. Then there's central limit theorem and uh, various other things which could be done for IID. And then extended for independent, but with some conditions on the distributions. Okay. For, for several decades, uh, this exercises went on. Uh, by the time I joined as a PhD student, more or less IID thing is well understood what you can do and what you cannot do and not much you can do after that. But by then, already it was getting clearer that uh, everything, you need to go beyond independent. Independent is not the end point of probability theory. Okay. So this how can we move or can we move away from independence had been something which people had been working on or thinking about. And let me again begin with an example. Okay? Instead of an abstract notion. And uh, to be precise, this time I have picked out a, a, a picture of two dice being there. So consider toss of two dice, one red, one blue. Deliberately, I had to through, locate a picture where, where these are different colors for reasons I'll explain in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, assume to be symmetric. So we assume that symmetric in every respect. Okay. Arbitrarily, one dot, two dot, six dots have been put, but beyond that, they are same. Uh, everything, all faces are already. Then, it is reasonable to assume that if you toss one of them, all six are equally likely. And if you assume they are independent, namely they one has nothing to do with the other, it would then be reasonable to assume that all total of 36 outcomes that we may see, if we write down 
R and R represents the first out, uh, the number of faces on the red ball, B on the blue ball, and you write R and B as two numbers. Then total number of possibilities for R and B are 36. All can be modeled as equally likely. So this is our starting point. All 36 outcomes equally likely. That is our model. Now, what is standard in various gambling things is you take the sum of the two. Okay. So now on my omega of 36 numbers, I define x to be r plus b and y to be max of rb. So I have defined now two random variables. I assume that at the gambling house, he is going to toss two dice and uh, uh, he puts two bets. You can bet whether the sum is bigger than this or less than this. You can bet whether the maximum is bigger than this or less than this. Two bets are offered. You can choose. For each one, how much you have to bid, how much award you will get is given. One experiment, but two separate uh, things being offered. So here are precise rules. A gambler can bet rupees 100 on the event A and get a uh, uh, reward of 200 if the bid is successful or 100 on the face uh, event B uh, and would get a reward of 250 if the bid is successful. So A is a bid on the sum, B is a bid on the max. Okay. And uh, so, firstly, uh, uh, gamblers who understand these things will go and compute what are the expected values and decide whether to gamble or not. Okay. Well, one can see that the probability of A is 5 by 12, probability of B is 5 by 9. You can count favorable cases divided by total, equally likely case. So, probability of event is just you count favorable case. Each of them has an equal probability equal to 1 by 36. Add them over, you will get 5 by 12 and 5 by 9. So expected value of the first bet is 1000 by 12 and for the second bet is 1250 by 9. Uh, both are uh, less than the average. Uh, both than the amount they have to bid. The reward will be less than. Maybe I did a cal. I changed the numbers and I didn't do the calculation correctly or have I done it correctly. Uh, first one, the reward is 200 times 5 by 9, 5 by 12 is 1000 by 12. This is correct. Second one, 250 times uh, 5 by 9. Yeah, correct. Okay. All right. So, for a few days, gamblers do bid till they figure out what are the probabilities and so on and so forth. And the game starts losing steam. Everybody says, ah, it's a losing game. No play. So then, uh, so the host announces a variation. Okay. Host says, okay, okay. Just start bidding. If you uh, urges the gamblers to bid on A, begin with. And after the, uh, the toss is done already, and he declares whether A, uh, uh, the bid on the first one is uh, correct, uh, is success or otherwise. After that, you decide, do you also want to bid on B? Okay. So, in other words, he's giving the bid bidders or gamblers an option to bid on the second bid. An option meaning after seeing the first bid. Okay. So, few people bid for A. The dice is tossed and the host announces that the event A has happened and so those who bid on A give money, get money. Now, those or others, they can they have to choose whether they still want to bid on B or not. Somebody can say, oh, the guys who have won A, they, they have already ca captured their money, they can walk away. Well, maybe. And others, they lost it, but they can still make up by bidding for B. So the question is, should gamblers now bid for B? So in other words, uh, to begin with, we did this calculation and saw that the game was not favorable to the uh, not favorable to the bidder. 
it is in it is in favor of the gambling house your average is less than what you have to put money now some things have changed what has changed you have seen that first game has been successful first game the winner has got that can we factor in this information and reassign probabilities and recompute our object okay that is the question and now let's analyze it our mathematically suppose a has happened that means out of the total 30, we know that is happened so out of the total 36 probable possibilities one of the following 15 events has happened so we can list down out of 36 numbers all the numbers where that sum is bigger than 7 so one uh, if the first one is one it is off so one comma nothing will come then two comma six we have just written down now the first number is the uh, number on the red dice the second one is on the blue dice that is how i started my whole discussion to begin with okay and now we can see that out of all this exactly one which i have colored in blue is the thing where the face maximum is not above four there actually maximum is four but not above four but all the other 15 uh, 14 uh, possible things the uh, the maximum is above four so now to begin with you had 36 thing in which only so many were favor you were favored 20 or your yeah, yeah. now out of 15 you know do some have been eliminated one of these 19 one of these 15 has occurred and out of these 15 14 has in favor to you did you know anything more no all we know is initially they were all equally likely now all these 15 are equally likely and therefore it makes sense to define now or to say that conditioned on the event that a has won namely the sum is bigger than 7 the probability that uh, the max will be above 4 is actually 14 by 15 and therefore now you recompute your expected score has zoomed up and uh, the bid price is now 150 but you can get a lot lot more if you bid so if offered all the gamblers who know how to do these things in their mind will definitely bid or be if, if A has succeeded. So now we have gone one step beyond our initial thing of what probabilities are. This we are going to what is called conditional probability. How do you factor in uh, some observed event and reassign probabilities? How you can factor in information and reassign probabilities. And this quantity is called conditional probability of the event B given A. That means given that A has occurred. Okay. And mathematically, it is written down like this. Two events A and B. P P of B positive, we can't divide it by zero because we, we can forget about uh, that because that is never going to happen. So we need not worry about what happens if PB is zero. But given events A and B such that PB is positive, the conditional probability of B given A expressed as P A given B, this is the notation commonly used in stat literature. I am sharing what the pencil stopped working for some reason. Okay, when I need it again, I will critically need it. I will try to see what happened. Okay. So when PB is positive, the conditional probability of B given A given as written as P A, then a slash uh, horizontal slash dash B is defined by this formula and if you see in our example see our p a given b that means how many common elements are there 
we had we saw that b had 15 out of which 14 are common uh, also for b so a intersection b there are favorable cases of 14 so probability of a given b is 14 by 36 probability of b was 15 by 36 in the ratio 36 36 can will get knocked out and when we take this ratio like this you will still get 14 by uh, 15 so what this is saying is that intuitively what i argued in that particular example leads to this formula and thereby this formula can be justified in large number of examples and from then on this is taken as a definition of conditional probability and it connects heuristic notion of conditional probability as given above if we had somebody had come up with a mathematical notion which is not matching with heuristics people who at least want to use it in applications will not uh, accept it but this works and therefore it got accepted and uh, people are using it uh, <clears throat> but before i go uh, i will point out here that uh, Till now, what we were doing, I was saying that, you know, you can do it for continuum case when you go beyond countable, just by getting, uh, referring to what the Lebesgue and measures and so on. This is the departure that you can't by just blindly uh, following what Lebesgue did, because now how will you define conditional probability here? So, for, we want conditional probability also defined for when PB is zero, as will be clear soon. And that Somebody, 